Welcome back to Little Snickers, baby. I'm Michael Rainey. To my left, Cal Donjala. Chilling. <laughs> <laughs> Jacob Fermatera. What's up, my fellow penguins? Cooling out, baby. <laughs> Danny Dubs. Larry's Backyard Barbecue. Welcome back. Boys. Are you at least thankful that I gave you a heads up to dress warmly for this episode? Yeah, he didn't do it. <laughs> he did bring a hat, though. I brought a hat. That's warm. Yeah, Jake dressed like he's going to fucking summer camp, but he brought a hat. <laughs> but John, John dresses for this shit on any occasion. We once, When we went to fucking Spawn Ranch, he was dressed like he knew he was going to be kidnapped for a fucking year. Dude. He thought, and I could yeah. see the car the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were dressed like you were summoning Everest. You got it. Look, fuck you guys, all right? No <laughs> fucking on me this episode. I'm cold and I'm not taking this shit. Oh, man. He's just like, I yeah. dress like a fucking retard, all right? Sometimes it pays off. <laughs> all right. Do you guys think there's a reason why I have you draped in ice? Because you couldn't get tickets to Disney on ice, so you made your own retards on ice? <laughs> <laughs> all right. So there's two reasons now. <laughs> all right. If this ends up being a Joker episode, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> Are we making slushies? <laughs> All right. Well, let's find out whether it's going to be a Joker's episode or a stinker, which would be more appropriate for why I have you covered in ice. Yeah. It's kind of a. Yeah, go ahead. All right. Here we go. Flip that motherfucking coin. You win. <laughs> <laughs> you sure? <laughs> it's gone forever. Okay. <laughs> but I could tell right before I lost sight of it that it was a winning for you. All right. Thank you, John. I'm happy to have won because I'm very excited about tonight's stinker. Comes highly recommended. And he's somebody that I've known about since the early 90s. Okay. Uh, we had HBO. Can you fucking broke bitches relate? <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Damn. Yeah, we had that cable box too, bitch. <laughs> the black box? Did you get spice? <laughs> Dude. Oh God, some spice. <laughs> you guys don't do that. Do the hand the hand thing is making it worse. Stop. <laughs> <when you do. laughs> it's Pee-wee's gay house over there. Somebody said the right. magic word. Yeah, I had spice. Long story short, dude, uh, this uh, motherfucker got paprika brain. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, dude. You can't talk about Spice Channel and not expect me to eat this Mike's pussy. <laughs> But yeah, we had it all, but I was especially thrilled to have HBO and this. All right. So this stinker, he had three documentaries on HBO. Damn. When I was a child, I saw the first one and was absolutely blown the fuck away by what I was hearing. Uh, I think I know who it is. Give me a. Give me he, a he's a mobster, right? Or mob related? A legend. Yes. Hitman for the mob? Yes. Okay. Are we sleeping with the fishes? Is that what this is? <laughs> <laughs> you're sleeping with the frozen fishes, Jake. <laughs> All right, you're, talk, you're talking about none other than the Iceman, Richard Kuklinski. Okay. I don't know his, his Christian name. I just know Iceman. Uh, he was known as the Iceman, the Devil himself, Whoa. and the Polak. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this gentleman was born in Jersey City, April 11th, 1935. All right. His, born, his parents were total fucking pieces of shit stanley and anna however i've learned a lot about his mother and um this lady couldn't have had a worse upbringing herself and when richard talks about his mother in these fucking hbo documentaries he refers refers to her as the cancer yikes was he in jail <laughs> as a talking head in these documentaries yes okay. yeah yeah he was in trenton state prison so we could have seen him he's that close Oh wow yeah passed away in 2006 happy birthday and Heather richard kuklinski Natural causes? Uh, yeah, he had a heart attack. Actually, this was very he funny, too. He froze to death. <laughs> <laughs> he, I will, I'll get to that later. I'll leave that out right now. So his parents were really fucking horrendous towards him and his, and his siblings. It was uh, Florian was his older brother. Richard was the middle child. And Joseph was his younger brother. Did you say Florian? Florian. That sounds like... Was oh, that a funny name, name? Furman? <laughs> Okay, fair. Fair, yeah. Damn, fried your ass under all that ice. <laughs> Dude, his parents were so fucked up. So his dad came from Polish immigrants, and his mother's family came from Ireland. Her dad died of fucking pneumonia when she was a kid. You don't say. <laughs> pneumonia, you hear that, Jake? Yeah, I heard it. And his great aunt died of exposure. <laughs> <laughs> and you said Polish to and Irish. The dick. 
<laughs> Somebody should have called ice on his parents. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, judging by that saying, stain, somebody called ice on your pants, dude. <laughs> I can't believe how wet you were before the episode even started, dude. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I've never felt like a, Madonna, like a diva more. I, yeah, I was going to say Madonna. I briefly considered, like, fuck it, we might have to redo the Kathy, Casey Anthony episode now. I'm getting frostbite from you guys <laughs> just because of Jake's wet titty concert. Contest. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to win tonight. I can tell you that. <laughs> All right, so his parents were super fucked up. The mom's parents, they came from Ireland. The dad died of pneumonia. Shortly thereafter, the mom got hit by a fucking truck. Damn. How old was he at the time? <laughs> no, this is the mom, Anna. Oh, okay. So she's a kid. Okay. She goes to live at a fucking orphanage. The nuns are beating the shit out of her. And on top of that, she's being sexually assaulted on a regular basis by priests. That's rare. A Pri- straight, priest a on girls? Priest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe we should write, write them a letter of commendation. <laughs> So when Stanley and Anna got together, initially, he's a real sweetheart towards her. But quickly, the uh, shine wears off, and he's as abusive as you'll ever hear about somebody being. Part of his abuse was on berating her for not being a virgin due to her sexual assaults. Jesus Christ, what a fucking bad guy. The worst. And it's really... You keep it quiet over there, yeah, Furman. Jesus, we're <laughs> trying to do a podcast go. over That's here. Right. You're building a fucking igloo. <laughs> You fucking guys fucking dicking around yeah. I fucking igloo building causing all the ruckus I did a ride dogs barking <laughs> <laughs> Jake chill out dude would you fucking calm down <laughs> be, calm. be cool brother <laughs> I'm calm he's literally leaking <laughs> <laughs> I won't be able to stand after this <laughs> we won't need you to I got motorized wheelchairs for the both of you <laughs> <laughs> so, dude, how much exhibit, money did you pink, spend on this episode? My ride. All of April's Patreons are already spent <laughs> <laughs> on ice and motorized wheelchairs. If people are listening to this, we haven't really made this clear for the listener, but me and Jake are on the couch literally covered in hundreds of pounds of ice <laughs> in the biggest bags of ice that I've ever yeah. seen. Yeah. We were told to dress warm, and uh, boy, was he right. Wasn't that nice of me, though? Yeah. I could, yeah. You could have said something like "and water resistant." Yeah, and I, I never really dress warm on my legs, which is where I need it right now. But um, yeah, Mike, you did a good thing for us. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank Jake, you. there's no way I could have accounted for how hot you're running right now. Because I could hear that water trickling, dude. You want to get a bucket? Actually, there's a trash can right there. If you yeah, if we want to do it. All right, so let's get back to Richard Kuklinski's parents. Okay. So Stanley and Anna, they're both fucked up. Stanley is clearly clearly the worst one in the fucking house, though. Just beating the shit out of the kids, physically, emotionally, and mentally abusive, and doing the same to his wife. And on top of that, too, he's constantly sexually assaulting his wife. He su- is weird. And wrong. Dude, it yeah. gets even fucking like- worse. It gets to a point. Jake, if you drop that ice, I swear to God, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring I'm not in gonna drop the ice. A hundred more pounds to put on you. <laughs> He's gonna pull out a fucking blender and start making margaritas over there. <laughs> Dude, Stanley fucking Kuklinski is such a fucking bad guy that their relationship gets to a point where he says fuck it and just starts bringing home women from the bar to the apartment that he has with his wife and children. Wow. And they live in the fucking projects power move <laughs> that's wow. insane would you consider that jake what what do you do with the wife do you are you, do you say like get out of the bed go sleep on the couch uh tell her to get a towel <laughs> <laughs> so this is a fucked up situation to begin with and he's so abusive to the kids that in 1940 richard's older brother florian is killed by the father Oh, Jesus Christ. Apparently, he hits him so hard in the back of the head that it fucking ends his life. Goddamn stupid name, motherfucker. You named him. (laughs) And at the time, Richard's five years old. And in this book, uh, The Iceman by Philip Carlo, he says that his recollection of that time period was of the wake which they had in the fucking project apartment. And he says he remembers the smell of pine permeating the air. And his little brother in a pine box and him just thinking like he's got to wake up sometime like wake up wake up wake up and like the permanence of death like kind of starting to make sense for him. I will say this. He knows how to tell a tale because by his account he's killed upwards of like 200 men. 
However, he's only prosecuted for five. So his telling tales ability got him out? Like he's just making up alibis and shit? I think he recognized that telling these these tall mafia tales was a way for him to gain some attention, and he got a lot of it. He got a fucking a, a book from a, uh, a huge crime writer out of the deal, and he got three fucking documentaries out of HBO. Yeah, but was he allowed to profit from that? Isn't that he was not? Yeah. But it's like he just yeah, knows he's the out there. They know him. Yeah, it's insane. you think the industry would give him the cold shoulder? <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about some cold thighs right now, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, with all this abuse in full swing, like the entire family's got to cover up the kid's murder. They covered it up? So what they say is like that the kid fell down the fucking steps. The kid punched himself in the back of the fucking head to death. What am I supposed to tell you? <laughs> the guy had a good fucking jab. <laughs> <laughs> and he fell on the floor in. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, all right, what's this dead kid's name? Florian? All right, case closed. Accident. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so they're covering up this murder, and as Richard Kuklinski progresses into his teenage years, he starts to become more and more abusive. And at first, it starts out toward animals. Well, We've heard this before. I've yeah. heard this. You'll remember hearing this with Carl Panzram, but he does this shit where he'll tie cats together. Yeah, I remember you telling me that, and that absolutely cracked me the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> and he would like hang them on a clothesline or something. Throw them over the clothesline. God damn! And have them fight to up. the death, like over the clothesline, like how they throw shoes over the. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I forgot about like that a pair part. of cat verses. <laughs> 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 Fucked up, Jake. And another thing he would do in the basement of their project building, there was an incinerator. And he would bring cats down there, oh my God. toss them in, and and shut the door. And he would sit there, listen. and he would listen to the sound of oh. them rattling around. God. So he's a dog person. <laughs> Jake. John, give him some of your ice, please. <laughs> it's forming to my body. <laughs> so he actually... So he's not the only abusive one in the family. In... His brother, his younger brother, Joe, in 1970, when the brother's 25, the brother, the brother, Joe, shows what a piece of shit he's become. He lured, he finds out that a 12 year old girl in the neighborhood is missing her dog. Tells this girl he found her dog and it's on the roof of this building. Lures her up to the top of the building, sexually assaults this kid. Oh, my God. The dog is up there. That's okay. Convenient. Jake. <laughs> the, the dog is there. I mean, he wasn't lying about that part. Well, the dog's about to not be there. Oh, oh no. He throws both the girl and the dog off of the fucking roof. <sighs> oh, my fucking I'm, God. I'm laughing out of nervousness. This is his brother. This isn't him. Yeah. Uh, oh. The entire family is fucked, Jake. Jesus Christ. Did he get busted for that? I will tell you this. Uh, heights that high, he is walking a real tightrope. <laughs> I can't do that this episode, pal. <laughs> I don't have Dude, the body energy. Dude, uh, it's how tall was that building? I don't know. But it was enough to kill the girl. The dog oh. was still alive when it hit the ground. The reason why attention was drawn to the scene is because the, the dog, dog was, was yelping. Yeah. So people finally came out because they heard the dog yelping. They found a fucking dead girl and mm -hmm. a Jesus. fucked up dog. Mm -hmm. <sighs> New Jersey, man, I'll tell you. <laughs> The funny thing is, too, that both Richard and his brother Joe shared the same cell block at one point at Trenton State Penitentiary. Really? Or state prison. Did yeah. that dude go in for life after that? Not life, but um, he had maybe dog 32 life. years, which in dog years is <laughs> like 200 years. <laughs> All right. So he got that's a pretty yeah long sentence. But they didn't fuck with each other in jail just because they hated each other. Well, you, did you say his brother at, when this happened was his brother a minor when it happened, or he was? He's twenty five. Twenty five. Okay, you yep. said that. Sorry, the ice is messing with my Can memory. Can you listen up, buddy? <laughs> Something distracting you. <laughs> <laughs> the the fact that I had to send a search per party for my penis later, <laughs> and I was in search party. <laughs> You got Medea on the brain. Yeah, yeah. John, I just found out that when you said churlish a couple weeks ago, that's a real word. Uh, all right. It's and not it was appropriate. Like, it wasn't just Medea talk. Nice. What? I yeah, he nailed it. it. Fuck yeah, dude. Context clues. 
<laughs> Churlish. <laughs> Like I said, like a lot of the shit seems sensationalized, and a lot of the shit also seems flat out made up. Well, regarding Richard's no, stuff, everything that I just said so far definitely true, happened. Yeah. Where Richard Kuklinski, the Iceman, seems to take some liberty is in the shit that we're about to get to. In 1949, he tells the author of the Iceman, Philip Carlo, that he committed his first murder at 14. And you think that might wow. not be true? Does the writer think that's also a lie? Does he present it in that way where it's like this could be? No, no the way the way everything's presented in the book, the book is an ex, an exciting, interesting book to read. Mm -hmm. But when you start, you know, cross referencing the shit, there's no substantiation. Like case yeah. in point, he claims he committed his first murder in 1949, and he says that the person he killed was a leader of a gang uh, called the Project Boys Boys in his neighborhood. This kid called Charlie Lane. He was one of a, uh, three different kids that fucked with him, constantly beat the shit out of him. And he says he waited for him. He knew where he would come off the train, knew where he would walk into the projects. And he said he waited for him, and he had this uh, wooden fucking dowel. And when he came across him, beat him to death. the kid's like, what the fuck are you going to do, Polak? And Richard Kuklinski says that he beat the shit out of him. And initially, he wanted to just beat him senseless, but he says he couldn't stop. And he beat him. He killed him. Kind of cool. If it's beating true. Up, you're beating up your bully. Uh, yeah. You know, fuck that piece of shit. Right. Standing up for yourself. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but there's no, like, you can't find out of that kid. No, died. there was never, like, a missing kid or anything in that era named Charlie Lane. Okay. So, yeah. Who the fuck knows? Where it really gets fucking out of hand is he says that what he did next was he stole a fucking car, loaded Charlie Lane's body into the back of the car. And in the trunk, he says there happened to be a hammer and a hatchet. He says he hammered out Charlie Lane's teeth and hatcheted it off his fingertips, then drove to the Pine Barrens and dumped the kid's body off there so it wouldn't be found. Which is... Why are you I mean, doing all that? Yeah, you're yeah. not fucking Kevin McAllister, buddy. <laughs> like, I don't, I'm not buying it. <laughs> I made Charlie Lane disappear. <laughs> Who the fuck knows? Uh, at this point, he says he also forms his own gang. You want to take a guess as to what Tr Richard Kuklinski, the Iceman's gang, is called? The Polish Pork Rolls. The Cool Boys. <laughs> the Coming Up Roses gang. <laughs> I like that, dude. It's kind of cool, isn't <laughs> yeah. it? So far, this guy rules. <laughs> <laughs> his brother sucks. Not a big fan of the brother. <laughs> Yeah, a real pain in the neck that guy is. So their thing is sticking up card games, robberies, burglary, shit like that. He ends up uh, becoming a pool shark during this time, too. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, and I believe this, I believe, that he gets good at pool and he starts hanging out and he starts like meeting all these unsavory, ca unsavory characters in pool halls. And there was one guy that he says he beat to death, which was a cop named Doyle. How the fuck are you gonna get away with that? I know. So I, I really think he's just hamming it up for I the heard cameras he, here. I heard he beat him in pool five zero because he's a cop. Mm -hmm. So then he gave him the one eight seven. You got any more ice? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think my brain is functioning with all this ice. Well, going on. we're gonna cut it off and put it next to Walt Disney. <laughs> <laughs> 1950, he's, once we get into the 50s, he claims that he starts practicing murder by killing homeless people. Oh, man. He admits to this like after being convicted for the murders that he's convicted for. He says that's not even the half of it. Right. Okay. Practicing I mean, he, 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 he can tell a good story, and the shit that he does tell is interesting. Um, most of what I don't believe happened, because it's, it's just not substantiated, are the depth of his mob associations. You think he was talking that up? I do. Yeah. Uh, the one connection that I, that I think is probably true, we'll get to in a little bit. But other than that one connection, I don't really see it. I just think he was engaged in so, so much fucked up shit that he's inevitably going to come across some mob guys in that yeah. time. And he's from Jersey City, so... You big, know, big area for it. Yeah. He's in the right time at the right right place at the right time. Buddy, to that point, the, the big family... 
the big mafia family in uh, Jersey at that time was the Di Cavalcante family. They were the inspiration for Sopranos. Nice. They're the ones who bought the hockey rink and all that stuff in Connecticut? No. Oh. What do you think? All Italians are the same, Jake? <laughs> yeah, they smell all the same. But, dude. <laughs> so where he says um, the mob associates, association start are with this guy uh, from the Gambino family called Roy DeMeo. Isn't the DeMeo family from Sopranos too? Could be. Right? Am I messing that up? I wasn't a huge Sopranos guy. I've seen it once, but... I'm pretty sure that's who is like the original family. Okay. I don't know. This is not making for good podcasting, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> We can just assume every family in Jersey that's Italian was the Sopranos. Yeah. Yeah. Now, they, um, DeMeo owns a bar called the Gemini Lounge, and Roy DeMeo heads his own murder crew. And they had a very specific way of killing people called the Gemini method. What do you boys think that includes? I'm betting it's a couple cold beers and twins. <laughs> <laughs> No, they were Gemini's the twins, right? I don't know. The astrological sign is the twins. I don't know. Yeah, I think so, yeah. And twin. I'll do it again. And twin. (laughs) (laughs) You are off. Jake, you want to take a shot at this? What is the Gemini method in your eyes? Gemini method, uh, I would say, is like smothering them with a pillow while reading them their horoscope. That's not bad. It's pretty yeah. good. All right. I will say there are numerous steps to the Gemini method, and it's, it's extremely illogical. It had to have made a mess. So the order was they would have you come in a side door at the Gemini lounge. They would have you make as much noise as possible with the bag of ice that's in your lap. I keep turning the <laughs> mic off every time I do it. He's wearing the headphones. He can... <laughs> Danny Dubs can back me up on this. Okay. So <laughs> once they got you in the Gemini lounge, they would shoot you in the head. <laughs> they would then place a towel over the wound in your head. They would then stab you in the heart. Their logic was that it would cause less blood to come out of your head. All right? All right. Not because they thought you were a vampire. <laughs> <laughs> Jake, I wish I had two silver bullets right now. <laughs> <laughs> and twins. <laughs> But, dude, after they would stab you in the heart, they would then bring you over to a bathtub to allow you to finally bleed out. You're dead. <laughs> yes. After yeah, yeah, yeah. Fucking, if the shot in the head didn't do it, the heart. Right. But you continue to bleed, obviously. And they uh, they willingly go in this side door after knowing no one's ever walked out of the side door. <laughs> well, I don't know that they know what the Gemini method is. Okay, they're not like regulars at that bar. They could be. There's so many people that come in and out of there. And um, when the FBI eventually did surveillance on the Gemini Lounge, once they started cracking down on the families in that era, the only time that one New York New York one New York uh, police department cop said we only saw Richard Kuklinski's license plate in the parking lot one time. Hmm. So for as close of an association as he says he has with Roy DeMeo, I mean. It's yeah. not really. There's no chance up. he parked down the street <laughs> and walked a block to the fucking Gemini Lounge. You How just you ruined know? my whole presentation. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm back on. I'm back on his side. So I'm with you, John. Now at this point, he's married. He's he, his wife's name is Linda, and they have two kids. He's super abusive to her. He's not a good family man. He's basically turned into his father. Still doing dumb shit, uh, but he he he's trying to fucking um, make ends meet by working in this fucking warehouse. At the warehouse is an 18 year old girl named Barbara uh, uh, Perucci. So a uh, a beautiful young Italian woman. At this point, he's fucking 25, and Barbara is 18. This is the lady that becomes his wife, or he's already got the wife and kid. He's already got a wife and kid. However, he's constantly hitting on Barbara. Yeah. And the the guy who owns hey, Barbara, <laughs> you want to take a peek? Let me see Barbara. Yeah, hey, Barbara. Barbara got a bush. <laughs> Can I see? <laughs> Let me see that thing. Oh, she do. <laughs> For the listener, we were just uh, doing the childhood pussy hand thing. <laughs> Never learned the real name of that trick. 
I think that's it. Uh, we'll pussy call, hands. Yeah, we'll call it Barbara's pussy. <laughs> All right, so we just looked at Barbara's pussy. And uh, the guy who owns the fucking warehouse sees what's happening. And he's warning Kuklinski to stay away. And he says, he tells other people at the warehouse that it's because Barbara reminds him of his daughter. And I don't, I don't know if that's in a weird way or just that he's in an altruistic way, genuinely looking out for her. Right. Richard says, you know, fuck this. I don't need this job. I'm out. He quits. And then he's laying it on thick at that point to Barbara saying, look, I just lost my job. I really want to date you. She's like, all right, fine. I'll date you. She starts bringing him around to her house and her family. They instantly take to him. But there's one aunt. She starts. She she knows something's a little bit off. The fucking aunt hires a private detective to follow him around. And like one day of research, he is married <laughs> with children. Uh, he's a murderer of homeless people. <laughs> it's not looking good. And uh, brings back all the dirt. And the, the most important aspect is that he tells the aunt, who then tells the rest of the family, that Richard is married with two children. And in the book, they describe this interaction. And it's it sounds like a very Italian argument. The aunt's like, you're going to he's going to get you pregnant. You're going to fall in love. She's like, I'm just dating him. She's like, you're going to get pregnant and fall in love. She's like, I'm, fun, cool. I'm just dating here. She's like, all right, if you're just dating, you have my blessing. So she's allowed to have this motherfucker keep coming by. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the family, they're just like, all right, fucking whatever. He seems like he treats her nice. He buys her nice shit. He's pleasant to be around. And it's the first time where he's around a functional family. So it's kind of working out for him. They end up getting married. Uh, they end up having three children, Merrick, Kristen, and Dwayne. Richard is closest with Merrick. The other two kids, he barely fucks with at all. I say closest, and I use that as a loose term, because um, he does interact with her the most, and he does show her the most affection. However, he takes her aside to spend time with her. They go fishing and hang out and shit, and he will tell him some of his darkest secrets. And all this time, Jake, like the kids are watching him beat their mom's ass. He never hurts the kids which is odd. However, he does fuck the wife up in front of them. Jesus. And the kids are so scared of him and they're so scared by what he exhibits toward their mom that they um they always had bags prepared to potentially leave in the middle of the night. Damn. It got so bad that the mom and uh, Merrick were plotting on how to um poison his meatloaf with cyanide. Oh, my God. Whoa. They couldn't go through with it, though. They almost saved so many lives. <laughs> I guess a lot of those guys would have gotten whacked by somebody else anyway, but yeah, that's the like homeless a, guys would have lived. We're going to find out soon enough that there's some fake cyanide going around. That's a good... What? Yep. Wait, they really tried? Well, Richard Kuklinski, he buys cyanide off of an undercover cop, and Kuklinski is suspicious, so he's like, I'm going to go for a walk. So he goes for a walk, and he sees a neighborhood dog just roaming around, and he gives this dog cyanide, and nothing happens to the dog, so he knows he got got. Wow. But he didn't get arrested for it? Not yet. Okay. All right, so at that Don't point... Don't you get arrested on site when you're buying cyanide from a fucking undercover cop? <laughs> no, dude. A, a lot of sting operations work like the Impractical Jokers. <laughs> <laughs> like, all, right, all right, now give it to the dog. Now give it to the dog. Give him a little bit more. See what he does. <laughs> During this time... Um, yeah, so he's taking Merrick out on uh, fishing trips and just doing all kinds of like seemingly dad-daughter shit with her. But he's just telling her about all this fucked up shit that he's done and the fucked up life he's led. And perhaps the most fucked up thing he says to this poor kid is that he's like, Merrick, at some point, I may kill your mother. And if I kill her, I have to kill the three of you, too. And he's like, I just want you to know oh my God. that it would hurt me the most to kill you. That's nice of him. Uh, kind of. <laughs> just beat my ass, dude. Don't tell me this weird shit. I'd rather you just be an abusive <laughs> father yeah. than fuck that's fucking your brain what, up more. What does Merrick do with that information? It's it's funny you bring that up because there are starts pulling the anchor up. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna go back in. Uh, I gotta take a shit. Uh, can we go back to shore? <laughs> yeah. But there there are a number of interviews with her, and she says like at that time, you know, she gets emotional and she's like, I understand. You know, part of it was just because you know she's been in, she's been abused to this point. So I don't know. She may have actually like think that she 
or actually comprehended that like look this is definitely what's going to happen or she just wanted to get out of that situation without that that thought proceeding yeah, any further yeah. you know either way very fucked up for a kid to deal with he would um uh one funny thing that i that i read was that during arguments he would routinely yell out I'm the king of this castle. And the mom would clap back at him, say, It's, a par- it's an apartment. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, they actually. Is that really what she would say? No, she would say, You're the king of nothing. No. <laughs> Damn. You're the king of 5B, you piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> How many kings you know got a buzzer? <laughs> <laughs> How to go to storm the castle? You just got to hit the fucking buzzer. <laughs> Dude, they actually had a very nice house. Um, they lived north of fucking. Uh, New Jersey in an area called du- or north of New York City in an area called Dumont, New Jersey. Okay, uh, it was a very nice place. Um, he would buy he he provided a lot of nice things for them. He was very big on projecting a very wholesome image. How was he making money after he quit that job? It's a great question. He started working in a film lab in New York City. This is where, like, I think he started to make some mob connections, and I think this is where he became familiar with people's names and who did what and who was who. So he's just like a photo mat kind of thing? No. Or film it, film, like shooting it, film? It's a bootleg distributor. Um, For real? There were two types of films that they would primarily bootleg. You guys want to take guesses? Naughty one, films. <laughs> one of them's human porn, the other is cats and dogs getting it on. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but they were... I, there may be... No, there's another kind, though. Guess what else they... They bootlegged and distributed. Uh, the snuff films, wedding videos, maybe <laughs> cartoons. Oh, they were they would steal art like Hanna Barbera, Looney Tunes shit. They would Mary Melodies, whatever Looney Tunes, um, Hanna Barbera, and Disney, and then sell them in a reel to reel format. Yeah, I think what where it was where it was happening was that they were selling them to movie theaters, so movie theaters wouldn't have to pay for the rights oh, to films. Oh, so it's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Crazy. And also people too Like if you had a fucking projector at home You're like How much for the new Bambi <laughs> You know you could get <laughs> well, What kind of projector would people have at home That's I, like rich people I shit, know right? it's better down where it's wetter <laughs> How much am I gonna give for that <laughs> Is this Harvey Firestein <laughs> You're like right there <laughs> Bonjour Good day <laughs> How is your family? <laughs> oh no! Why am I getting hard on all this ice? <laughs> you think this is going to be good for my diarrhea? Let me tell you this: this it must be good for this provincial life. What? It must be more than this provincial life. I meant to say. <laughs> He's singing uh, "Beauty and the Beast" to you. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. B sides for "Beauty and the Beast." <laughs> <laughs> Nothing from Frozen. <laughs> <laughs> Jake, just fucking let it go, man. <laughs> nice. What else should we talk about? <laughs> what other songs you want to sing <laughs> in an Italian voice? Um, that's Amore. Oh, is that a Disney one? <laughs> no. Are there any Disney Italian songs? I guess Pinocchio would be. <laughs> I don't think it's. I think he's Italian, but Geppetto. Yeah, he's Italian, right? Oh, I'm getting splinters over here fucking his kid doll. Hey. <laughs> Tell me you got the receipt for this fucking kid wooden doll. Um, did you know that Geppetto was short for Geppettophile? <laughs> did you know that, guys? <laughs> it adds up. <laughs> oh, this is actually very funny, too. The Iceman says that he would watch Looney Tunes cartoons to get ideas for how to creatively murder people. Oh, my God, dude. <laughs> And I believe this, dude, because one of the ways that he said that he would kill people creatively he was it, painting a fake tunnel, <laughs> <laughs> tying a piano. A lot of auto accidents. <laughs> <laughs> Victim's last words were "meet me." <laughs> Looking up, is that a piano? <laughs> Acme Anvil Company. <laughs> uh, one of the ways that he created to kill people, he says, was called the tree. So he was fucking 6'5", close to 300 pounds. So he was a fucking monster. What the tree involved was him wrapping a cord around a victim's neck, throwing them over his shoulder like a fucking satchel. Dragging them. And just like like holding them there and yes, having them so hang like as though they were hanging right. from the limb of a tree. Damn. I would love to know if there's a Looney Tunes cartoon that he got that from. Yeah. Because it sounds very cartoony. <laughs> yeah, that's like <laughs> very Tom and jerry <laughs> Who, who came first like the Iceman 
or Iceman from Top Gun? Like year, like were they around the same time? No, uh, Richard Kuklinski was uh, a little before that. Okay, I, I'm a few years because the murders that he is eventually convicted of, he's convicted of um, five murders. They're all in the eighties, eighty to eighty four. Really? Yeah. So Top Gun he came out in eighty six. Started in the fifties. Yeah, yeah. Uh, forty nine. Yeah. yeah, but I don't believe that because I think that um. The pr- the closeness in proximity to the murders that are substantiated, like that, just seems like it's it fits in more with the serial killer's mo. Yeah, you know, I don't think you're really that like spaced out, and I don't know. Yeah, who knows though? I don't know because I don't think like like four years seems like an appropriate amount of time for somebody for the cops to be on to you. Yeah, you know, if you're starting in 1949, although you know it was so much harder to track people and to gather information, and I guess it was so much easier to believe that you know. Kids could punch themselves to death. So he got convicted for five. He claims to do 200. Yes. That's a lot of cold cases. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jake, I love you. <laughs> I love you so much. <laughs> oh, man. So he's fucking. Um, oh, another thing that I found funny in regards to like how he splurged on his family with gifts. The kids all went to great schools. They all had nice shit to wear. At one point, he he buys his wife a twelve thousand dollar raccoon coat. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ, dude! Was that ever a popular fur? I don't to think wear? so. How could they charge that much for it? I, uh, dude, he is probably retarded. Oh, oh, no. <laughs> Jake, why are you so bad at Wait, this, man. Jake? <laughs> <laughs> Can't you just Guys, fucking I had a joke. sit with the ice? Hold on, you said a raccoon coat. Did he come Larry, home? would you be able to go up to uh, upstairs and get a towel from the bathroom, I'm please? So sorry. Thank you. So I, what wait, happened he, was he's got a joke. I got. All a right, joke. hit us with it, Furman. The raccoon coat. He brought it home, gave it to his wife, and said, "They're out of skunk." <laughs> <laughs> Do you think he presented it to her like it was a Lexus commercial where he's like, go look in the trash can. <laughs> but it's daytime. <laughs> I don't care. Go look in the fucking trash can. Would it kill you to look in the trash can? Are the buttons on the jacket two raccoon hands <laughs> intertwining like this? <laughs> oh, dude, this is also great, too. He would. Oh, my God. Dude, at one point. Don't worry about it. It's Mike. Mentally, already decided that his fucking room is going to get soaked with. Did you ice. decide that, or were you like, "This going to be clean"? Jake, it's whatever, man. There's no way you're he being a good sport all right now. In thinking, you're being such a good sport right now that I, I could never kill you for spilling a little bit of water. I mean, it's what forty pounds of water. Eventually. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Danny. Dose. Dude, at one point, you, his daughter Merrick, she goes into um uh the, the fucking hospital. For a um, a bladder issue, and this is around Christmas time. Richard Kuklinski plays Santa Claus to the kids in the fucking hospital. He dresses up and he has the kids tell him who they want murdered for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> um, they just name all the doctors that diagnose them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna make him an offer he can't diagnose. <laughs> One very romantic thing that Richard Kuklinski would do for his wife is anytime they would go out to eat, he would call ahead and he would tell the restaurant to ensure that the song Lady by Kenny Rogers was playing when she walked in. Wow. <laughs> is that real? Yeah. How? What do you mean? How did they have the technology back then? It's a radio. It's probably some 83-year-old Dago in a fucking <laughs> stevedore outfit holding a little boombox. Yeah, it's not a fucking radio station. They don't have a collection of cassettes to pop yeah, in at somebody's request. I, I, dude, I don't know. He that's he had the power. All right, that's a powerful man. But here we're in the '70s, so there's definitely records. Yeah, I don't know how they were playing music in restaurants in the '70s. Listen, this fuck is- me. I don't know. Must be the ice getting to my legs <laughs> that's making me say this stupid your, shit. Your brain is John, in your legs. Bear in mind, you're talking about a man who was bootlegging porno and fucking Disney. <laughs> so he probably knew how to replicate fucking sound. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we'll go with that. Fine. There was there was the name of one film which I found that wasn't strictly porno porner. Um, porner. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of Medea porn. Pornocchio. <laughs> <laughs> Every time he lies, his dick grows. 
<laughs> Talking pleasure island over yeah. here, baby. <laughs> 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 Well, I got no condoms, as you can see. I got no condoms on me. Is he fucking a whale? <laughs> Definitely he... be a sperm whale. <laughs> What's he doing to that whale's mouth? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, this is kind of creepy. Too. What was the whale's name in Pinocchio? Mandingo? <laughs> no, John. You can't say that. <laughs> that's a porn star's name why can't i say that that's a derogatory term <laughs> then why does he go by that because it was probably the 70s i've seen him in recent more recent things call him manny all right is that really a bad thing to say the only derogatory no, term we're going to say on this podcast is dago man dago how's that <laughs> yeah there we go <laughs> 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 all right I wish I didn't find out this information. And <laughs> there, there's nothing to indicate that anything sexually inappropriate happened between Richard Kuklinski and his kids. However, he did nickname his oldest daughter the Snuggler. That could be wholesome. It could be. So could be. we're going to go with that. Oh, dude, another thing. Oh, my God. Sorry, I'm getting so excited watching watching you guys freeze to death. <laughs> Thinking all these funny anecdotes. I love that you're wearing a fucking t-shirt <laughs> I was wearing a tank top Tommy too. Bahama. Yeah, dude, that would be great. Just heat lamps on yeah. you. <laughs> Catching rays from the fucking ceiling fan. Dude, he would um he would often get so angry during domestic disputes that he would punch himself so hard in the face that he would pass out. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <man. laughs> That's awesome. Hey, being around all this ice, does it make us a lifeguard? <laughs> <laughs> We're about an hour and a half from becoming certified lifeguards here, baby. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna say yeah, John. I'll go with that. Um, yeah, I did mention that they they fucking uh, thought about poisoning his meatloaf, and then all right, so he's in cahoots now with a guy who's also in the tape distribution called uh, George uh, Maliband. Okay, and they apparently have a deal worked out where he's going to pay twenty seven thousand to Richard Kuklinski for these tapes that he has. So it's probably some naughty tapes. You know what kind of stuff goes on naughty tapes, take, don't you? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Take a guess what they do on the naughty tapes, Jake. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They put their dick in the bags of ice, just like you're doing right now, Jake. I have to adjust it. So, dude, <coughs> he's working out a deal for to sell these tapes to George Maliban for twenty seven thousand um, dollars. They're friends. Like George comes over to his house all the time, and the family's used to seeing them. They just think they're buddies. What the fuck is on those tapes for that amount of money? That's insane, dog. Um, my feeling is it went deeper than just straight up porno. Yeah. I think there was very fucked up shit. That they were peddling. There's a murder on there. Like the original yeah. Back like, to the Future, the one they filmed with that other guy. <laughs> Ladies in the porno start disappearing as they're killed. <laughs> <laughs> However, at a certain point, George stops coming around and the family knows not to ask any questions. But what happens is Kuklinski shoots him five times and kills him. Stuffs his body into a fucking steel drum and drops it off by a fucking chemical plant in Jersey City. You meant like a barrel, not like a Jamaican steel drum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when the cops come, you just gotta you gotta whip out your fake dreads and put them on. Toyota's hot, hot, hot. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know what happens when I get Irie? <laughs> so this is his first murder. This is 1980. Uh, this is uh, January of 1980. So he commits his first on the books murder, which he eventually ends up getting prosecuted for. And it's his old homie that he murders. Yep. Uh, the next year, he ends up in a similar deal where a guy's trying to buy tapes off of him for close to $100,000. Jesus Christ. What the fuck? Are you withholding this information? I'm you, not. No, you don't know it's okay. Now, here's the deal. Like, with this one... We got to get in the tapes business, fellas. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, in, in this one, I in, in a couple different places, I've seen the tapes described as blank tapes. For $95,000. There's no fucking way 
Like the, you're buying fucking blank tapes for that kind Is of. Is there money. like yeah. drugs inside the cartridge? You know no, what I mean? Like something I, like that. Jake, the only thing that I could think of is that it's just very fucked up porn. Yeah. That you can't get from a fucking porn warehouse or wherever porn comes from. Like something like the like porn fairy. You said didn't you say snuff earlier? The movie yeah. Eight Millimeter. Ever seen that? Nicolas yeah. Cage. Yeah. They do. They be doing nasty things. I used to. Um. I used to sing with a band called uh, Dirty Diamond. Do you remember them? They start. Excuse me. Yes, uh, we used to do song parodies. In it was live Neil Di- performance. Yeah, it was Neil Diamond song parodies. I came to the band late. Um, Jake, wait, is this real? I swear to God, it is. You but, were in a band. I, well, we just sang. All three of us just sang. There were no instruments. The yeah, music the, was uh, instrumental. Instrumental music. Yeah. So it was me, um, Sleazy E, and Dirty Diamond, and I. Uh, I was a roadie called uh, Ricky Full Throttle Fuckenheimer. And we would sing these uh, these Neil Diamond cover songs, but we had a snuff porn song. And uh, if I rem- let me see if I can remember it. It was we make snuff porn, we fuck them, then we kill them every day. Two lovers play a scene, but only one gets paid. Fucking and killing helps us get us through our days. <laughs> I don't think you're nominated for a Grammy, but. Uh- <laughs> I, there's no way you just riff that. Where would you? Guys, no, I'm. T- this is real. Do you guys perform at like nursing homes or something? Where no, um, at the Kyber. Okay. What year? Probably 2004 ish. So it was related to comedy. Yeah. It was only Neil Diamond. What Neil Diamond song was that? Well, we, we've. Um, I don't even know. Is this pre Saving Silverman? No, post. I, I imagine Saving Silverman was probably. Very early 2000s. Did you get the idea from that? No, it was Dirty Diamond's idea. And we just became friends and he asked me to come on. Dude, we need to pause for like <laughs> a few minutes for me to... F- Are you guys as flabbergasted as me about this? Yeah. This is fucking crazy. <laughs> but that, that was one of my favorite songs from our performances. Oh my God. Well, do me a favor and don't ever sing any of the other ones. <laughs> So we almost have a reunion <laughs> tour. Uh, <laughs> we, did, we did eventually uh, cover a Justin Timberlake song. Um, I'm not going to say the name of that because it's uh, very inappropriate. I'll tell you after the show. All right. So going through a second victim, buying $95,000 worth of tapes. This gentleman's name is Louis Mazgay. <laughs> <laughs> We're 10 years old. Old y'all. <laughs> He shoots and kills him, and this is where he gets the nickname the Iceman, because he chops him up and he puts his body in a fucking freezer. He says it's to, if the body's ever found, he says it's to um, kind of throw the cops off of what the time of death may have been. Okay. So it goes in the freezer and it stays there. It stays there. Now, where is the freezer located? I don't know. It might actually be that fucking Gemini Lounge. On the roof. Yeah. <laughs> We got a dog up in a freezer. You want to come up and see him? <laughs> All right. So April 29th, 1982. This is kind of a funny one. There's a pharmacist named Paul Hoffman that he's in cahoots with. He's trying to sell Paul Hoffman $22,000 worth worth of this uh, antacid medication. <laughs> Fell off a truck kind of thing? Yeah. <laughs> That's got to be like fucking 20 pallets worth I, dude, of medication. Yeah. I know. But it's much cheaper price than he would get. He's giving him a hell of a deal, I bet. (laughs) (laughs) He's giving him Ajit is what he's giving him. (laughs) But dude, he um, he tries to shoot Paul Hoffman. The gun jams, so he's forced to beat him to death with a tire iron. Jams his body into a steel drum. And then uh, places the body in the steel drum across from Paul Hoffman's favorite hot dog stand. (laughs) <laughs> and he said he would regularly go back there in the in the next few weeks and sit there and eat, get eat himself hot, hot dog. dogs and just sit there and laugh to knowing himself, that to, knowing that the body's there. It was wow. just next to a bunch of other drums that would not be yes. looked through yeah. for some yeah, time. Yeah, nobody's going to fuck with this shit. Favorite hot dog stand. <laughs> the guy knew his favorite hot dog stand. He wouldn't shut the fuck up about it. <laughs> Do you have a favorite one? Um, no, I don't think there, there's enough of them to really narrow down. One Jake, you got one, buddy? Uh, John's Doggy Shop. That's yeah. my favorite. Yeah. 
We're going to get them one day. Uh, one day. Deerhead hot dogs, Delaware represent. Oh. Deerhead number one, the sauces. Oh. Dang it. I lost the comedy competition at Deerhead Tavern. Deer Park. Deer Park, yeah. When? Probably 2003. <laughs> Dude. Did you sing your Neil Diamond bangers nah. up there? <laughs> Dude, the first prize was 500 bucks. Ooh. Fucking A. Dude, and it was me against a very funny guy named Chris Morgani. And dude, at the time, my cable was cut off. And like, dude, I, I was really fucking sharp and on point at this time. I was convinced I was going to win this. I made it to the finals against Chris Morgani. And I was like, there's no way I'm losing this. I called my wife. I was like, yo, get ready. We're about to have cable again. Sure HBO. enough. Dude, I lose. Like, they. it was like a judge's point system. I lost by like three points or some shit. Chris got a five hundred dollar check, and I got a um, a glass plaque that said "Damn, I finished second. So when I finished second, I was, I was very gracious inside. As soon as I got out, did you get front, a free meal. I did not free burger. As soon as I got outside, I fucking launched this fucking glass plaque against the facade of the building. Damn, bad boy. Yeah, I was a bad boy. Bad boy, Mad Mike coming dude, through. I, <laughs> dude, I got it in me, man. Dude, I feel I I feel my degenerate streak coming every now and again. Like I could live. And a, a vanilla lifestyle, by and large, but by God, it, you gotta go smash it something needs in to come out every night. Mike, again, this baby. is this is bad, Mike behavior. What's going on right now? You're grooming us for murder. Is what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, I just want to see what what they look like near ice. Yeah, this might count as my cooling period. <laughs> <laughs> All right, back to Kuklinski. Like at this point, he's got a little crew. Um, one of his boys, this guy named Percy House, gets arrested. They're doing mostly burglaries, fucking car thefts. Um, That's an awesome name, by the way. Percy, Percy House. House. Yeah. Percy House. <laughs> hey, it sounds like a real coxman. Of the coming up roses, boys. <laughs> <laughs> he gets busted, and they're in the like, stolen fencing goods and shit. He gets so, busted. Sorry, that, that's a Medea whorehouse. <laughs> Percy House? <laughs> Come on down to the Percy House. <laughs> Is Percy a character in those movies? <clears throat> no. It must be, right? But No, it's what it, you eat when you go yeah, to these houses. Yeah, you go there to eat Percy. <laughs> That is churlish. Now I get it. You got because you twisted it up, dog. I forgot that you twisted it. Is that Madeira? You having a stroke? <laughs> yeah, Yo, you'll be up in there twisting it up. Is that Elmer Fudd? <laughs> it's Foghorn Leghorn. No, it's a New Orleans accent. <laughs> I said, I, I said, I'd like to buy some pussy. <laughs> yeah, no, twist, twist the pussy up for me. <laughs> <laughs> Finish this shit up so we can go back to the Neil Diamond stuff, man. I will not be able to. This is like when you fucking have a question in class and you cannot pay attention <laughs> for another fucking thing the teacher says until you get this explanation. I will gladly pay you Tuesday for some pussy today. <laughs> All right, I'm done. All right, so they think fucking uh, Percy House is going to rat. So their crew's in a fucking uproar. Uh, there's two other guys. It's Gary Smith and Daniel Deppner. Daniel Deppner and Kuklinski are convinced that Gary Smith's going to rat. So they eventually lure him to a hotel. They're like, look, we all got to fucking hide out for a little bit. We got to chill out because Percy might fucking dime everybody out. They end up fucking killing Gary Smith in the hotel room and they just hide his body under the bed. <laughs> <laughs> they leave him on the pillow like a tip. Well, initially they just stood him up the corner of the room and put a lampshade on his head. <laughs> That so, guy went on to write Weekend at Bernie's. <laughs> and eventually, like, people started complaining about the smell in the fucking room. And uh, they found the body eventually. Eventually. They did, yeah. Dude, how, how many, many people, people slept on yeah. top of that guy? Talk, this was weeks before they found this. Stop it. I've heard it described as being under the bed. And I've also heard it described as being between the mattress and the box. <laughs> Could you imagine? There's no way it that it could be. Dude. However, how funny is it to picture this body just, just being, being sandwiched? A lump. Yeah. <laughs> like a dad sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> Was it a vibrating bed? <laughs> <laughs> so that's 19, uh, December of 1982. December of 1983, the last member of the crew is this guy, Daniel Deppner. Kuklinski starts feeling like, all right, he's going to fucking rat on me now, too. So he's getting paranoid. He, Kuklinski ends up getting diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder. Okay. So he don't be trusting motherfuckers. He doesn't trust anybody. He has no conscience, no fear of anything. He's the ice man. Dude, he is ice running through his fucking veins, baby. <laughs> We're the ice boys Ooh. now. <laughs> Guess where he takes fucking Daniel Deppner to murder him? Chuck E. Cheese. Disney on ice. <laughs> He takes him to the apartment of his daughter Merrick's boyfriend. 
this wow, guy they're there no so the boyfriend is named rich patterson and he's out of town for a month or so for some reason R- richard took a liking to him and for some reason richard has a key to the apartment he lures daniel Deppner there he fucking uh he kills him in the apartment leaves him there and within a few days rich patterson comes home and richard's there with the body <laughs> and fucking rich patterson's like dude what the fuck and Kuklinski convinces him that it was a drug debt that had gone wrong. Kuklinski said he wasn't involved, but he stumbled upon the body. And he, he overdosed. His head's cut yeah. off. <laughs> <laughs> it was some good shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was definitely fentanyl. But he says, like, all right, look, I know these guys who killed him. You know, we, we just we can't call the cops because, you know, they're going to think you're involved, too, because it's in your apartment. He's like, I need you to help me move the body. We can't call 911. So he helps them move the body. They drive to like a wooded area close by and they dump off this dead guy's body. And he lives to tell a story. Yeah, Rich Patterson doesn't get killed. Okay. Wow. You know, he like doesn't him. get charged as an accessory to a crime? No. Dude, well, I think you're able to explain it away because the cops understand just how fucking this guy could be yeah, fucking the he would have murdered me. me immediately. Right. Yeah. If no, you guys yeah. open your door right now, like to your home, and there was a dead body and of you know a, an authority figure in there, I would say because it's you said it's a boyfriend. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, what would you guys do? I would put it on your front doorstep. <laughs> <laughs> I would actually put it in your car. <laughs> Use the carpool lane. For that one. Oh, dude! Uh, quick aside. Uh, you know the marina close by here? Yeah. Yeah, they found a dead body in a car. Yeah, right? from two thousand and three. What, dude? This, I didn't know it was that old. This fucking week, um, probably about five blocks over from where I live. Uh, we're getting closer and closer to giving out my address every week. Yeah. <laughs> All right. But well, five blocks is actually only 16 doors from there. <laughs> but in the marina close by to here, this private dive team was hired by this family of a man who went missing in 2003. Whoa, that's how they found him? They did. I mean, dude, I don't know how the... Co- well, I get how the cops Dude, I was missed. like, what did they... There was... Dude, they yeah, they dude, they built like um when the, they're building up the marina, the people who they built a, no oh. the the fucking um whoever did construction there yeah because it it's like a full functioning marina now and there's a nice mm-hmm. restaurant there yeah but apparently there was a pylon situated um like right next to this fucking guy's car so they must have no Does, doubt yeah. like how do you put that there without knowing that it's going there to are like divers involved you guys in know there's a car there right? are yeah. yeah yeah and this guy was missing in 2003 he was diabetic. So it seems like he probably went in the shock and his car just fucking. It could have not been foul play. It could have not been. Yeah. The family hired this dive team. The family had to hire them. Two decades later. Dude. And this shit's fucking incredibly expensive. But they were able to get together the money, the money to hire this dive team to come in. They went down there and the guy's body was still in the fucking driver's seat. Just imagine how scary that's got to be to be a diver and you see a fucking skeleton driver. That would freak me the fuck. They Chris. can't park. They never use their turn signals. Those stupid skeleton drivers. <laughs> Who? Unfriggin' real. <laughs> it's very sad. It's very sad. You want to hear another Dirty Diamond song, Jake? Is that what you're trying to get me to do? Because I'll sing more. Jake, stop it. Don't make him do this. <laughs> Drunk off the cock. Ain't no surprise. A couple of drinks and she starts blowing guys. <laughs> Got nothing to lose because she's a dumb fucking flues all the time. Is that what you want, Jake? The, were you the lead singer? No, the, I was a backup. Oh. <laughs> None of these have been familiar diamond melodies, by the way. Even that was Love on the Rocks. That was Love on the Rocks. I know the name what of that was one. your Sweet Caroline riff? No. Sweet no, Cocaine we- Line. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> I'm listening, <laughs> and I'm paying to get into the show now. All right, <laughs> no more diamond stuff until the end. I, okay, I cannot lose track of. I won't stop asking diamond questions if I get going. All right, it's all good, baby. All right, so after the Deppner murder, the state police get involved, and they're investigating not the murders initially. They're investigating local burglaries and car thefts, and uh, they're putting together a sting operation called Operation Iceman. So they're aware of Richard Kuklinski. They know. He's probably done some fucked up shit. And as they gather more and more information on him, they realize like, okay, he's probably also responsible for these murders of his boys. 
So they kind of pin it on him with the fucking first couple. They don't have the evidence yet, but they're going to get him talking. The way they get him talking is um, there's an ATF guy named Dominic Polifrone, who he gets involved. The ATF gets involved because they're also running guns. Mm -hmm. Dominic Polifrone ends up uh, befriending Kuklinski, and he gets him to admit to all kinds of fucked up shit with the wire on. And they're talking about fucking acquiring cyanide to fucking kill cops. Dude, it's fucked up. And this fucking guy, Paula Frone, is linked up to Kuklinski through a guy named Phil uh, Solomine. So Phil Solomine and Kuklinski are buddies. And Dominic Paula Frone is like, comes off as like a buddy of Phil Solomine. So he's vouched for it. So Kuklinski's like, all right, you know, if he's good with you, he's good with me. While he's wired, they hear Kuklinski admit to all these other murders. And where it all comes crashing down is December 17th, 1986. This is the cyanide story I was telling you about where he wants to kill a cop. And he goes through with it or he well, actually attempts it? He's trying to acquire the cyanide to poison this cop. Because and then he what, shows up with fucking Dunkin' Donuts. He's like, hey, boys, <laughs> this one's on me. But no, he's he meets uh, Dominic Polifrone and Dominic sells him fake cyanide. And that's, Another fake cyanide well, deal? Dude, this was the one that I mentioned earlier where he gives it to the neighborhood dog. He's like, I'm, oh, okay. I'm going for a walk. Yeah. He gives it to the dog. He knows that's not it. Now, he says in these HBO documentaries that cyanide usage was one of his favorite methods of execution. He would fucking stab people. He would strangle them. He would shoot them. But cyanide was his preferred method. And he said the way that he would go about it, it instantly made me think of Dumb and Dumber. He says he would put it on hamburgers. <laughs> So this day where he buys the fake cyanide off of Dominic Polifrone, he's like, he's like, I'm going to go for a walk. He goes out, he finds a dog, gives it to him, doesn't do shit. He's like, all right, I'm just going home. Goes home, picks the dog, his- follows him home. He falls in love with the dog, <laughs> takes the dog to the park every day, regrets his decision, turns his life around, becomes a good family man. Pairs it up, lets it have puppies. Like, it really is a nice ending. <laughs> they rename him the nice man. <laughs> <laughs> He goes home, he picks his wife up, and uh, the police at this point, they have enough information. They, they, they are fully convinced that he's going to eventually acquire what he needs to kill this fucking cop. And they fucking swarm on him. They arrest he and his wife, Barbara. And when they arrest him, um, they find out that he's got Swiss bank accounts and he's actually got a plane ticket to Switzerland. So he's aware that they're on to him and they're probably going to close in at some point soon. But thankfully, they get to him before he can do anything else. One thing that I don't think was just something completely made up was uh, this other murder that he speaks about in the documentaries. And it's mentioned in the book, The Iceman by Philip Carlo, is where he he kills he well, he, he fucking executes him. He waits for him. He kills this uh, NYPD detective who was apparently like on the take. He was making three grand a week telling car thieves where cops were planning on busting, a busting brain. people. Yeah. yeah. Once it becomes clear that like he's found out by his own police department, they're going to use him to try to uh, find out more information on the mafia guys that he's in cahoots with. Oh, so they put him on the front lines and he gets murdered. Yeah. As a result. So he's Kuklinski says that he waits on a, a section of road that he knows this cop takes home every day. He pulls knows over. Cop. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, leaves his car there so like the car stranded is to where like it's an impediment to other drivers he knows the cop's gonna stop sure enough the fucking cop pulls over starts to go up to check out the car and he's got a super soaker filled with cyanide for him (laughs) (laughs) there's a dog close by whose mouth he's shooting into the dog (laughs) like it's a hose but um he says that he um he kills this cop with a shotgun blast whoa wow now he this this is something this is one of the few things that seems to substantiate his mafia involvement. Is that scene in the movie? Did you see the movie? Uh I'm aware of the movie, but I didn't watch it. Okay. Just I had no desire just because it, I, I know that it makes him paints him out to be like a family man and that he had two separate lives. Okay. So And you disagree with his portrayal that way? Yeah, I'm really not into it. Like I've watched the Iceman ta- the, the HBO things and I've read the book. Yeah. yeah. I feel like, you know, that's all I need in this life of sin. <laughs> but in regards to that murder while there was no physical evidence tying him to that cop murder he eventually gives police enough information as to where they believe that he was there and he says that he was 
contracted for that job by Sam the Bull Gravano, who was a member of the Gambino crime family, I believe. And they had busted Sam Gravano on fucking selling ecstasy in Arizona. So he was in jail, but they wanted to try to get him on some murder charges. And this one seemed like ecstasy in the 80s. Wow. Yeah, it was fucking ahead of his time. Yeah. Well, this ended up, I think the ecstasy arrest happened during the 90s. Okay. And in 2003, they arranged for Sam Gravano, or I'm sorry, for Richard Kuklinski to testify against Sam Gravano. And they were going to charge the both of them. Kuklinski was charged in the murder, and he was going to implicate implicate Sam Gravano. For a lesser right. sentence. Yeah. Do you know what they were going to offer him in this? Offer him? Like what, what I don't know what they were going to offer. No. Sentence would be? I don't. But not as, kill him or like not life in jail. Well, he already He's well fucking killing dude, a cop, dude. Like he, he pled guilty to two of the murder, two of the five murders that he was charged with. So after he gets busted with his wife, he's charged with five murders, pleads guilty to two, is convicted of two, and then there's one. The it's the um the Paul Hoffman murder, the pharmacist. Mm-hmm. He's convicted of that, but they choose not to sentence him because he's already got two life sentences plus like over 60 years. He's not getting out. So it would just be like a waste of tax money, I guess, is their thought process here. Yeah. But going back to the cop murder that he says he was contracted to uh, perform by Sam Gravano in 2003, Richard Kuklinski dies. So he was going to be their star witness. So they weren't able to to fucking charge Gravano for that crime. Damn. How did he die? Um, heart attack, I believe. Okay. Burger with cyanide. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, this is actually kind of funny. Um, he said that in the event that if he should um, need to be resuscitated, he would like to be resuscitated. But his wife on the sly signed to do not resuscitate order. What? So when he died, they didn't resuscitate him. Damn. Yeah. Bad bitch alert. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy that cop murder is so similar to his first murder. Of the bully. Like, because you said he was like kind of stalking him and mm-hmm. like he knew the route he was going to take and just kind Dude, of waited for he's, him. He's all of the behaviors that he talks about in the shit that was substantiated and the, in the shit that has been fully substantiated, they all jive. Like, he, he's fully capable of this shit. And yeah. like, when you see this motherfucker in these documentaries, he is fucking chilling, especially the last one. <laughs> <laughs> just like you guys <laughs> dude the last documentary on hbo it's him um it's um 2002 it's him being interviewed by the psychiatrist um named park deets dr park deets and <laughs> what is so fucking funny for him <laughs> it, it is a silly name i'm with you on that fuck hey. you mike we like the name let us laugh all right park deets and he looks like a park deets he looks like somebody from a <laughs> I couldn't pick a Park Deets out of a lineup if I had to. Park Deets sounds like something that perverts give one another to jerk themselves <laughs> off in the woods. <laughs> Yo, Spike, you going to give me the Park Deets or what? <laughs> you want that dick sucked or what, Spike? What color handkerchief am I supposed to hang in my back pocket if I want my dick to get sucked by an asshole? <laughs> <laughs> Let's go give me the park D. Is that how it works <laughs> in San Francisco? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it you does. You have dicks to... get sucked by assholes. <laughs> That's what I'm imagining right now. I thought you were talking about the handkerchiefs. That's that would that would be a funny conversation to have with a guy. And be like, hey, before we do this, there's just something I got to tell you. You know, assholes are usually just assholes. <laughs> well, uh, I, I got a condition. I got a mount on my asshole. <laughs> I mean, these these are some these are some puckers. Uh, where was I, John? What? <laughs> <laughs> We're like the Seattle fish market over here. <laughs> yeah. So Kuklinski dies in fucking uh, two thousand and three. I think it was. Yeah, you said you had said that part. Uh, you know what? It might have been two thousand six. I may be wrong. Oh. That changes things. How so? I graduated from high school in 2005. Oh, yeah. It really changes things. So Jake. I could have really. <laughs> you know what? I made the noise and I was just like, oh, I have to come up with a reason why I made that noise. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, good, baby. Oh, look. Did you rip open the bag? But <laughs> but here, to, before we finish up with the Iceman. Ice everybody, baby. <laughs> But uh, before we finish up on the Iceman, I yes. definitely would. Don't, 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 don't. 
<laughs> did you just fart at me? No, I, I did. That was funny. <laughs> yeah, I passed it over to Jake, and he was supposed to put it in your mouth. <laughs> don't, don't rip it. <laughs> All right, before we wrap it up in the Iceman, I just want to say, even though I think a lot of the shit is made up, I definitely recommend watching all three HBO documentaries. If you go on HBO Max, you can find all three of them. The one with the psychiatrist is the best one. He actually gets mad at the guy during it. He's like, uh, you almost made me a little mad there. He's like, what was it that made you mad? He's like, something you said, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the guy implied that like... So Kuklinski at this point is speaking about a road rage triple murder that he says he committed or like the guys. Do you think the psychiatrist is buying this shit too? Well, no, and I think because makes him because he's off. challenged on this. Yeah. yeah. Well, he's not challenged in that. It's a lie. He's challenged in that questioning whether Kuklinski thought his reaction in killing these three men was the appropriate reaction. Yeah. And, um, yeah, because Kuklinski says, like, yeah, I fuck. And this, this, it, these are three murders that actually happened, but I don't know whether or not he committed them. It's up in okay. the air. But, you know, because there's pictures of this shit. Apparently what happened was he's arguing with three guys in a single car on the road. They pull over and get out, and they have bats, I think, and he's got a gun. Kind of a dream scenario come true. For every dad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or anybody that's ever had a little bit of road rage. <laughs> you get a little road rage? Uh, not really. I just like to drive drunk. faster than everybody else <laughs> when I'm fucking drunk. <laughs> that's a big JK to the authorities out there. <laughs> but I definitely recommend those three documentaries. You can watch them on fucking uh, HBO Max and then also the book The Iceman by Philip Carlo. All three documentaries are still available. They are, on yeah. On HBO Max. Yeah. That guy's got a fucking dude, the, the a fo popular following or dude, there were fucking representation. Um they recorded. I, I I wonder why they didn't put out more because there's three documentaries, they're each like forty five minutes long, although they recorded seventeen hours worth of interview. Now, as interesting as that shit is, the Philip Carlo book is pretty awesome because they recorded over uh, 240 hours of interviews. So there's a lot of really fucking cool details. Jake, are you jerking off? Is that what that sound is? <laughs> it's a, something's dripping back here. It sounds like an incessant drip. All right. So why are you melting the ice so fast, pal? <laughs> All right. This seems like a I good cannot point. believe we fucking did this. The I'm proud time. of you guys. You really did it the whole, the whole fucking time. You guys sat here. Surrounded by ice, were troopers about it. All Jake had on was a hat, uh, a little zip-up <gasps> sweatshirt, and no pants. <laughs> and John, I would have, I would have worn a diaper tonight if I knew this was going to be. Oh, I'm wearing one for you, buddy. <laughs> How well, warm? You always are. <laughs> How warm are you right now? Um, it's just my legs that are cold, mm -hmm. and my back, and my heart, and my uh... pussy and crack. <laughs> <laughs> Jake, how are you holding up? I'm, you know, I'm doing okay. Just one leg is taking the brunt of everything. Ain't that the way it goes? Yeah. Wow. Is there anything I could have done differently to improve this experience for you guys? I actually don't have any notes. Jake, do you have anything? <laughs> you know what? I'm I'm good. Uh, maybe, maybe some more soda for you to put your ice into? Or... <laughs> that ice hasn't even been touching you this whole fucking time? You oh my God. fucking phony. I did not even know that. I didn't know that. Oh, Danny, is there any chance you could bitch. place that across Jake's chest right now? <laughs> <laughs> well, boys, did you have fun tonight? <laughs> I sure did. And don't think you're getting out of this with a couple, with a couple you. more fucking Neil Diamond parody cover band <laughs> questions. Dirty I'm Diamond. happy to answer. Do you guys have a MySpace? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. <laughs> we might have. How many performances did you do? Uh, I think I did only three. We were at the Kyber, and then we did um, a male strip club. What? Yeah, oh <laughs> yeah, it was a uh, Club Risque at the upstairs. The upstairs at yeah. the upstairs of Club Risque in There's Philly. A male one it's, upstairs. It's a male strip club. Downstairs oh, is the ladies, and upstairs is the male. Dude, in the in the in the green room of the male strip club. It, they had all these posters of these fucking jack dudes with huge dicks. And then they had like this this barbell set in the corner so you can Dude, get pumped up before you went out you on get stage. Your pump on. <laughs> <laughs> Should you I get that from like back here? You sounded like a kid talking about basketball posters. <laughs> all these jack guys with huge dicks. 
on the wall, yeah, staring at out. me. <laughs> yeah, this was our face jam. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like the the Jordan logo, but with a third leg. I'm staring at these pictures of these like jack guys with huge dicks, and I'm like, I believe that I'm by. <laughs> I believe I could suck a guy. <laughs> Think about it every night of day. Spread my cheeks. I swear to God, I'm gay. Who oh, I believe that I'm sore. <laughs> <laughs> From letting guys into my back door. Oh, I believe that I'm by. I believe that I'm by. Oh, I believe that I'm by. <laughs> So they had that. <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't do that one back then. <laughs> you know, you really should have opened yourself up to more than just Neil Diamond <laughs> well, that's, songs. Dude, that's why we branched out to uh, Justin Timberlake. The one Justin Timberlake song that you will not mention on air. Can you say the, the uh, real name of the song, not the parody uh, version? I'm bringing Sexy back. <laughs> Jesus. All right. Do you want me to tell you the parody song? Yeah. Yes. Wait, I don't know. Are we going to be able to air it? Is it going to make me look bad in association with you? Yeah. It, yeah. it was. It okay. Was, let's not do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I I'm, see Mike's eyes. Let's not do it. <laughs> so the real song was I'm bringing sexy back. The parody song was I'm smuggling wetbacks. <laughs> That was our last performance. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I wonder why. <laughs> well, the kitchen staff ran us out of that last <laughs> venue. Dude, dude, hey, I dude. didn't say I agree with it, Jake, uh, but I mean, in all the <laughs> hundreds of hours of podcasting you've you done, were... <laughs> how the fuck have none of us ever heard about the phase where you were the third fucking singer <laughs> in a Neil Diamond parody band? Hey, man. Are you guys are still as shocked as me, right? This is the <laughs> craziest thing that I'll never be able to get over. And you are just like, this is this is me. This is Mike. It's my life, baby. <laughs> when you did the, the men's strip club, did they hire you? Yeah. How did they find that? <laughs> so the MySpace like, page. <laughs> I mean, it didn't. It wasn't functioning like the ladies section of the strip club was because, like, the ladies come in at like fucking noon or whatever it is, and it's like running all day. Yeah. The men's review was more of like, a, you know, just a smaller window. <laughs> Say it was from like fucking eight to two, and we came in at like maybe seven o'clock. From like seven to eight, it was for like fucking fat ants who were just chomping at the bit to get in there to be entertained by something. And was there a cover charge specifically for your band or once you were in, you were in, you didn't have to pay again? I don't remember. I don't remember making any money. I, my, <laughs> you know, I'm not surprised about that. <laughs> and I'm really glad that you were not paid for that. But you took a poster. <laughs> yeah, they were scratch and sniff too, Jake. <laughs> I actually, I performed there too. Oh, yeah. for real? Yeah, for real. As, As a band. dancer? <laughs> for we, real in we, your band yeah my band performed there yeah the fucking men's we, section of we were, risque is a fucking <laughs> rock venue half we, the time we were a dirty it's a rock hard venue a dirty you called crazy whores <laughs> <laughs> um, now did we uh yeah we played up there got booked by like a third party there weren't any dudes up there uh thankfully when we were performing but they did send some ladies up oh and they surprised us on stage while we were performing by asking you for money <laughs> Dude, they started grinding on me and my wife's in the crowd and i'm like i'm looking at my wife like i'm not doing this i'm not doing this and she's like rubbing you know my elbows in between both her boobs and their c-section scar and like yeah because they weren't sending the a-listers upstairs for that show dude all right. But there was a cover charge. It was like 15, 20 bucks. Damn, Jake. Yeah. I got... This ended up being too much information for me in one night. <laughs> <laughs> That's really fucked up that you were in that band. Mike. I know, dude. <laughs> Honestly, out of all the things that I've divulged on here, like that's I feel yeah, you kept that in the back pocket for a long time. For I, it wasn't intentional, but it was it was just it was a very innocent time. What was your uh, drug of choice at that time? It's funny you mention that. Um, <laughs> yeah, 
I need to know the root of this. No, you know what? This was 2006 because like I had gotten into coke pretty heavy 2006. <laughs> Paxil. <laughs> <laughs> One of the stipulations for me to be brought in to perform with these guys was they said like, look, because dude, we had we had nights where we were like we, we had choreographed dances. You, st- so like we, we had to like be at certain spots like and practice and you, sing and dance. You said stipulation. You had stipulations to join the band. They told me I had to keep it together if I was, and I really wanted to do this. So, so they're called Dirty Diamond and they want you to be clean. Yeah. Be, because both of these guys are like the nicest guys. You can't guys. have you getting fucked up and making a mockery out of our <laughs> Neil Diamond parody band. <laughs> But, so what did you have to do? You had to keep your nose dance, clean. You Mike. could only you couldn't get blacked out. You I remember all your performances. I literally had to keep my nose clean. <laughs> that, that was the stipulation. <laughs> do you remember any of the dances? One was um, it was a lot of this, and then a spin around. That one was called uh, <laughs> "You're Never Gonna Leave Me, Baby." Um, that was a stalking song. Were you an, a Neil guy before this? No, I just I I like these guys a lot. And how did you f- yeah? How did you find them? They used to do a podcast. Ah, uh, fuck, I can't remember the name of it. But and this podcast would have like a number of like local Philly comedians on, and they were very funny. I liked them a lot. And yeah. then uh, I went to see them at I think Mojo Thirteen in Delaware, Jesus. and I thought they were great. And then we became good friends. And then they asked me to come on and sing and perform with them. Dude, Mojo Thirteen, that's the red flag right there. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah, that that's the touchy uncle of venues. <laughs> Man, you've been a podcaster a long time, Mike. Thank you. I've always had it in my heart. <laughs> <laughs> they had a podcast in two thousand six. Is that they? I didn't know they Dog, had a podcast. dude, I was well. The one that we were talking about before the show, um. Our podcast then was called The Donkey Show. That was like 2004, I think. God damn it. <laughs> Furman, you need a blanket, buddy. Nah, I'm just going to cut myself open like a tauntaun. <laughs> Sleep in yourself. <laughs> yeah. That would be cozy if we could make like a replica of that. Just cut myself open and yeah. sleep in there? Yeah. Like a dog bed. Yeah. <laughs> cut me open. It's like looking inside of a love sack. <laughs> <laughs> you can put it back here. Right in my, uh, you got your little ice cubby. Well, Mike, this is one of your best your best ideas yet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, man. I knew it would bring the best out of you guys, too. Yeah. yeah. Well, this was a lot of fun, boys. And I can't thank you enough for being good sports. And do you think being... Surrounded and covered by ice added to the experience of the Iceman. I'll be honest. I expected more uh, ice in his story. He Dog. put one guy in a freezer and the nickname sticks for the whole fucking. There's a book named that. Yeah. He could have been the fucking uh, dog side night. Or, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, now I got to get fucking 20 dogs in here for next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. F- five 40 pounds of bags, bags of ice was a lot better than uh, buying fucked up beagles from the pound. <laughs> You're not supposed to take them back. Yo, I did take one let's back. Let's try time. to take the ice back after this. <laughs> Just for fun. Just for funsies. <laughs> but yeah, I didn't end up needing it. <laughs> all, all we're just soaked on the legs down. <laughs> what the fuck did these guys do to that ice? <laughs> yeah. Their crotches are soaked. <laughs> <laughs> Why do they have cold boners? <laughs> they My call them deadwood. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Damn, I caught the sillies at the end of this one. I cannot believe it's called hypothermia. <laughs> you got haha thermia. <laughs> Yo, this this I'm not gonna lie, Mike. This rug is it's soaked. We're gonna fix it now, Furman. All right, let's wrap it it's up. It's just water. Did you put anything on on wax with your band? Is there any recordings we can? I'll do? find it. Uh, I know. I I I got a physical copy of a CD from uh, the one guy Sleazy E. <laughs> So I'll get it again, and I'll find a way to get it out there. (laughs) (laughs) All right, cool. Yeah, I'd love to hear. I'd love to hear you guys work. (laughs) (laughs) All right, guys. Furman, Kaldanjala, Danny Dubs, 
Larry's Backyard Barbecue. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you guys for watching and listening. And my God, what a fun episode. Thank you to our patrons for making all this possible. If you're not a patron yet, you can go to patreon.com slash little stinkers. That's L-I-L-S-T-I-N-K-E-R-S. You get first access to all the episodes. You get all the extras that we do. You get the monthly AMA. And we got a bunch of other super weird shit lined up that I'm going to make these fuckers do in the near future that will make it worth your while. It's four bucks a month, or you can just pay 40 bucks for the entire year. Or you can just send us some ice. <laughs> and yeah, you send us 40 pounds of ice a month. And uh, I'm going to have Danny we'll Dubs jump it. on this, and I'll do the Provo soak to this bag of ice. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're not a patron yet, again, go to patreon.com slash little stinkers, L I L S T I N K E R S. But if you are a patron, thank you guys so much. We love you guys and just really appreciate you for making this happen. All right, guys, have a great week. We'll see Thanks, you next time. Thanks, everybody.